Good morning again, everyone. Thank you for coming. And because the subject of today is precious corals, I've decided to invite as a panelist, Enzo Liverino, and some of you know him, but for those that don't know him, Enzo Liverino, he's the president of the Coral Commission of Sibjo, which is the World Jewelry Confederation. He's a coral expert. He knows all about coral. Everything I know about coral, I, I learned from him. That's why some people say I don't know nothing. I'm, I'm just kidding. So, um, Enzo, if you are ready, if everybody is ready, I don't know, Enzo, if you want to say something before we start. Uh, good morning to all friends and uh, thank, thank you very much, Rui. What you are doing is something fantastic. Oh, thank you. Um, it's really fantastic. Uh, everybody knows your uh, generosity, but uh, this is uh, over the imagination. Um, it's fantastic things that will help us to, uh, uh, how to say, will help us to uh, uh, go on on this dramatic situation. Uh, remaining at home is no easy, and uh, uh, for, especially for people who, who, who normally uh, travel a lot or uh, uh, go to work. Uh, so this is something uh, really uh, fa fantastic. Uh, no no other, uh, other things. Thank, Thank you very much, much Rui. Thank you. Okay, well, let's, uh, let's start and... Um, uh, okay, so uh, the session today is on precious corals and um, some issues uh, that are related to these fantastic biogenic gem materials and we will discuss and clarify a few issues, namely uh, the topics of this session. And by the way, for those of you that attended the Vicenza Oro Gem Talks, I think two years ago, the JMA conference, I think two years ago as well, and the FIG uh, symposium in, um, in Holland a couple of months ago, this is the very same presentation with a few changes. So this is not new. For some of you, this is the second time, third time, tenth time you've seen this presentation. But for some of you, it's quite new. But this is just a disclaimer. So you see, you, you've, if you've seen it, you've seen it. So even the jokes are the same. So we are talking about what are corals, uh, specifically what are precious corals as they are defined in the jewelry industry. And we will see that biologists, they have different definition for the term. Also exploring some tradition and lore around corals. Uh, we will discuss a few co precious coral species, and this is a bit going into biology, but not so complicated, don't worry about it. Because of the sustainability issues, we will address what CITES is. Uh, there is a lot of confusion about what CITES is, so we will clarify the CITES issues around precious corals. And also the identification challenge is not to identify something as coral, but to identify, identify the species of this precious coral, because we will see that that is really relevant. And at the end, because coral is a biogenic um, organism, it lives in the oceans, and we know that climate change is a threat, we will also discuss a little bit of climate change initiatives that uh, we are involved in, particularly through Enzo's leadership in the World Jewelry Confederation. So let's begin. And this is the most complicated slide. Again, if you've seen the emerald one, I start with a complicated one um, on this presentation. And this defines what are corals biologically. I'm not going to attempt pronouncing all those funny names, but basically, this is to say that this is a biogenic gem material, co comes from animals. In the old days, people thought that corals were plants. Of course, old scholars, uh, namely in Persia, they already knew or, or they proposed that these were animals, but it was only in the 18th century with the discovery of the uh, microscope that they did see the little polyps, the living tentacles, uh, this is not tentacles, there is another name, um, uh, they were moving, so they realized that corals were actually animals and not plants. But anyway, uh, in gemology, we call them biogenic gem material. 
Some of you that, that studied gemology as I did, you remember uh, the, the word uh, organic gems. And we have been seeing it for ages, organic. And Sibjo, the World Jewelry Confederation, I will repeat this name over and over again, decided a few years ago uh, to stop calling pearls, mother of pearl, and also precious coral, an organic material, because scientifically it's not correct to call it organic. So because it's basically a bio-mineralized calcium carbonate with a few proteins and a few other organic molecules. So it's more accurate to call this a biogenic gem material. So keep that in mind and maybe in future gemological education that you might overtake in, in the future, you, you won't see organics anymore. You might start seeing the word biogenic. So coral, precious coral, as many other biogenic gem materials like shell, for instance, bone, teeth, they started to be used by our ancestors in prehistory. And this is a really nice example of a necklace from uh, 6000 BC, which is quite old from the Neolithic. Also in the Bronze Age, we see testimonies of the use of, of coral. When we go away from the areas where precious coral were harvested, namely in the Mediterranean, and all those artifacts that I've shown you before, they are Mediterranean corals and they, they, were, they were found in the Mediterranean area. India doesn't produce uh, precious coral, but we do know that in India, precious coral was, was quite precious. It is even one of the stones of the Navaratna, I don't know how to pronounce it, which is this one over here. So as a very important stone, it was so precious that it was one of the nine stones of this really highly important talisman for, for the Indian culture in Hinduism. Also in Buddhism, there is a lot of significance of symbolism with uh, uh, precious coral, with the red Mediterranean coral. And China, again, is quite far away from the Mediterranean. So imagine the trade routes. I mean, you know the Silk Road. You have heard about the Silk Road. So products could come uh, back and forth from Europe to Asia, Asia to, to, to Europe. It was a normal trade route. So in China, we also find this, and it is very strong in, in Buddhism. Even in Africa, and this has to do with the Portuguese. Um, when the Portuguese were sailing um, to the Orient, to India, around the African coast, we stopped here, here and there in the African coast to make trading, especially gold. And when we arrived in Benin, Benin is a very small area in, the, in Nigeria, in equatorial Africa, we traded coral and we brought coral from the Mediterranean because it was really cherished by those people. And we go, this goes back, back to the 16th century. And even today, fresh, uh, precious coral, red coral is so precious in Benin that even the king of Benin in ceremonial um, events wears coral. This is the king of, of Benin, your majesty. And this is a official garment. Imagine that this was a tradition in Great Britain, and uh, I couldn't imagine Queen Elizabeth wearing coral. Normally she wears diamonds, but not as much, okay? But this is quite interesting. That's why in Nigeria, even today, not only Benin, uh, coral is quite popular. In the old days, coral beads were even considered money. Uh, they were considered like a monetary exchange thing, like some shells were also in, uh, in the air in the Caribbean. Uh, here it was precious coral because it was not from this place. It was imported, the Portuguese brought them and they were really rare. So this is quite interesting to know that in Africa, uh, there is no coral in there, but we, we the Portuguese, we, we send them there. So, and this is quite interesting because there is a lot of myths about coral and there is a strong symbolic around coral. Even in Italian, mostly Napolitan culture and Enzo, I'm sure he will address, he can, he can discuss it in, in after. Coral is a very, it's a very superstitious and powerful 
uh, token. And this starts uh, in the classical mythology in, the, in this book called Metamorphosis from, by Ovid, so it was uh, in, a, in a few years BC, that there is a story, you can check it out, I'm, going, I'm not going to tell you the story uh, from the beginning, but there was this lady and she was quite uh, like those very bad ladies that you see on soap operas. She was doing uh, bad things to everybody. So uh, Parseus, which is this uh, very handsome guy, and this is a nice statue from Benvenuto Cellini that you can visit in Florence when Florence opens for tourism in the future. He, to save his lover, uh, he went to this uh, young lady that is here, a deceased, and chopped her head. Her name was Medusa, and she was really evil. So he chopped the hair of Medusa and sent the hair next to the coast, and then uh, some uh, branches were around the hair of Medusa. Then a few nymphs, which are also beautiful ladies, came to the shore and brought the head through to the ocean, and those coral branch, uh, those branches became coral. So, and this, this lies, uh, all the beliefs around coral are in the Western civilization are based on Ovid's metamorphosis. So in the end, we can discuss it a little bit, and I'm sure Enzo has a couple of stories that he can share with you. That is why, in, even in paintings, we see a lot of coral being used uh, like in here, because it was like a talisman. It was a protective, uh, and it had miraculous powers, okay? It was really strong, and we can see it in a lot of paintings. Uh, also in Portugal, this is in the, in the Portuguese National Art Museum, now it's closed. We see this nun, and she has a rosary with beads, and similar rosaries can be found around the country, and this is a really good example. Maybe this one is that one. We never know. This is a 13th century reliquary. Look at this organic shape. This is precious coral from the Mediterranean. This is quite old. This is Middle Ages. And this looks modern. And this is really huge. It's a big, big piece. Also in Islamic culture, you have the praying beads, the tasbih, that can also be made of coral. Most popularly, they are made of amber, but coral is also a really important uh, material for the praying beads. It is it actually, it is one of the few gem materials mentioned in the Quran. In the Quran, you see a lot of mentions to pearls, a few to, um, I think, to garnets and to coral, nothing more. And of course, gold, but gold is not a gem material. And also in Judaica, you see the Torah pointers that can also be uh, ornamented with precious coral. And this is a nice example in a Jewish museum in Europe, New York City. Of course, that coral could also be made for decorative, uh, very opulent, lavish uh, jewelry artifacts. And this is a really nice set that is on the Enzo Museum in Torre Greco that was commissioned by Carolina Bonaparte. And I'm sure that Enzo will tell you the story, uh, the fascinating story of this uh, set, because it has a story behind it. That why does Enzo own a uh, set that belonged to the Bonapartes? That's not a mystery, but he can explain it later on. It's quite an interesting story. After the 19th century, beginning of the 20th century, um, corals began uh, were discovered also in Asia, namely in Taiwan and in Japan. And after those dates, the coral species were different. And that's when we start to see those figurines carved, artistically carved in oriental and uh, vegetalistic in other motifs. Some are really good artist uh, carvings and this is uh, uh, another one. Of course, that not only in jewelry, but in carvings, but also in contemporary art. Some of you know this gentleman, Ian Faber. He made a great exhibition last year in Naples and elsewhere, depicting um, artifacts using Mediterranean coral. And quite recently, Ian Faber um, 
uh, Enzo Liverino, an artist of France, they offered to, uh, to a certain chapel in uh, Naples uh, a, a series of artifacts that you see here that are devotional artifacts, Christian devotional artifacts, that will be on that church next to Caravaggio painting. So in the future, this contemporary art will become antique art. That's how things are done. And of course, coral can be also a beer. And if you go to Madeira, you, can, you should order, not that guy, but you should order a, a coral beer. I would love to have a coral beer or a beer, but I, I, I have to stick with coffee. Okay, just hold on. It's a very old beer, by the way. So, I don't want to, to bore you with more cultural heritage, but there is a lot of interesting things uh, about the cultural use of coral throughout the ages. And the production areas were mostly, and still are, mostly the Mediterranean, Japan, Taiwan, and Hawaii. Hawaii used to be, and not anymore, there is no, no coral fishing going on in the Hawaii and Midway areas anymore, but they used to be back in the 60s. So, and there are a lot of processing locations, mostly in Torre del Greco in Italy and Kochi in Japan. And the consuming communities are all around the world and the American consumer is different than a Chinese consumer that is different than a Japanese and European consumer. So each area has, um, has a, a appreciation for lighter colors, pinkish colors, deeper red colors. So it, it is diverse geographically. And coral is present in many works of art, as we see, saw with Jan Faber and also in high-end jewelry. So, this was about culture. Now we go deep into coral. What, what does it mean, coral? Okay. In fact, coral is a collective name. So it's a name for more than 7,000 species of uh, what we call the biologists call cnidarians. I'm not, I'm not going into biology. I know there are a couple of biologists there, so I try not to go in so I don't make any mistake. But anyway, this is a collective name of more than 7,000 species of marine individuals, of marine species. And they can live in shallow water, they can live in really deep water, and they can live on the reefs, and we all know about the reef barrier, the, the, the coral reefs in the Caribbean and Australia, etc. They can live also in other ecosystems, and some are considered precious. So we have 7,000 species, and we will see that the precious corals are it's a tiny number of this. However, when we think about coral, we think about this. I'm sure everybody's thinking about this now because we are stuck at home. So this is like paradise. This is vacation. This is life. This is snorkeling. This is color. And when we think about corals, we think about this, life. Color, life, and lavish uh, animals, and fish, and turtles, and tortoises. And blah. But we know that because of climate change, a lot of things changed. And look at this picture that was taken in one occasion and after climate change effects. Those corals became bleached. They lost their color. They became damaged. And this is called bleaching. I'm, I'm not going to, to elaborate on that, but this is a damaging situation. And we know that uh, many parts of the world we have damaged corals. And we, when we have damaged corals, you have a damaged ecosystem. And corals are the base of a lot of animals and a lot of biodiversity. So corals are really, really important and they are being threatened by climate change. We know, even that this is public uh, report by the United Nations, that coral reefs are being a lot of pressure of the climate change and ocean acidification on them, okay? And if you want to see the reef corals, you dive and this is what you see. But if you want to dive and see precious corals, this is what you see. Of course, you don't see nothing. It's a black uh, screen. And why? Because precious corals today 
since a few years ago, quite a few years ago, are only allowed to be fished and harvested below, oh sorry, below 50 meters. Coral reefs do not produce species that are used in jewelry. So whatever coral we see in high-end jewelry, they are harvested below 50 meters and they don't live in the reefs. So the climate change challenges that coral reefs are suffering are different than whatever ecosystem we are talking about when we refer to precious corals, okay? So coral is not the same as precious coral and we must set this really clear because precious coral is only eight, some already say 10, but doesn't matter. It's a, a very few number, a very small number of species, eight to 10 species of corals, okay? And they don't live on the same ecosystem. So when we see some piece of jewelry and we call them coral, we see that the collective name of uh, jewelry, coral, precious coral and reef coral is the same, it's coral. That's why it's so hard to distinguish. We see a bracelet like this one uh, made by the late master Jose Manuel Rosas with precious coral from Japan. You, you hear the word coral, say, oh coral, oh coral reefs, they are endangered, but they don't live on the same ecosystem. It's not the same species. It's like saying, like, uh, I don't know, I, like thinking about the rat, I couldn't remember another animal, and thinking about the giraffe. They are totally different animals. They are both mammals, but they don't live on the same ecosystem. I mean, rats, they live everywhere, but not giraffes. So there is a, uh, they, they have the same name, mammals, but mammals, they are totally different animals. Uh, the same as in corals and in, in a much bigger sense. 7,000 species and only eight to 10 are used in jewelry. And this must be clarified. That is why CIBJO, the World Jewelry Confederation, made a coral commission in 2014, precisely to address and to help the trade understand and also the consumer understand what's in stake with corals that are used in jewelry. And Enzo Oliverino, he's the president of the Coral Commission since then. And um, since 2014, a lot of documents were, were published. I will send you in the end a link for a couple of those documents so you can, you can read them through if you, if you wish to know what kind of things we have been doing. And uh, we, have a, we have a coral book, but that's not accessible to, to everybody. But we have a precious coral information sheet for educators and you will see you prepared one and you can, you can have uh, the PDF at the end of the presentation. Also, there is every year there's a report on the, on the situation on corals uh, around the world, uh, addressing situs, sustainability, traceability, what have you. And also publish the do's and don'ts document. Uh, you will have this one in, in, in the end, okay? Don't worry about it. Don't worry about the link. I will give the link later. And also, uh, um, CIBJU produced this document, which is like basic rules on how to ethically trade on gemstones, pearls, and also corals. So I will give you uh, those documents. This one is easy to, to check uh, because the, uh, the URL is not very hard to copy, but I will give you those URLs in the end. But CIBJU has been very active uh, addressing those issues. And one of the definitions the World Jewelry Confederation made is what are precious corals. And for those of you that are biologists, precious corals in the jewelry trade is not the same as in biology. In bi oh, well, I'm pressing the buttons all at the same time, sorry. In, in, in the trade, we only consider precious corals a few species from those groups that you see in the bottom. Don't worry about the Latin groups, they are taxonomical groups. In biology, any coral that can be used for any type of decoration is called a precious coral, not in the jewelry trade. In the jewelry trade, precious corals are only those eight to 
10 species belonging to the Coralide family, for those of you that are biologists to make it clear. And the species are, are these ones. If you look at the left of your screen, you see gibberish, which is Latin. And here you see the commercial names. Here we know, I mean, for those of you that have seen corals before, you recognize a few of these trade names. The trade does communicate with the consumer using trade names, but if you want to trade the coral over borders, you must use the species name. And there is a reason for it, and that is CITES, the monitoring that we all should do to make sure that the, uh, the, that the resource is sustainable. So I'm going to go through very quickly to uh, just a few coral species. This is the very first one, Coralium japonicum, is the most expensive one probably. It's a really oxblood red, it's called Aka in Japan, oxblood in English. And uh, as you can see, the coral branches are quite beautiful and it's used for high-end jewelry. And it's very popular in China. The other species, which is the most ancient one from the Mediterranean, is the Corallium rubrum, the Mediterranean or Sardinian coral. Of course, not only Sardinia in Italy is not the only source of coral in the Mediterranean. You have Italy, you have Argelia, you have uh, also France, a lot of countries produce coral. And this is the most old one. And we see a lot of artifacts from uh, the traditional Boucheron and Cartier um, artifacts from the, from the Art Deco period to more modern um, jewelry from, uh, from the new millennium and also um, more simple, very delicate uh, necklaces. Look at this necklace from, by, by Asael. You see that the uh, beads, they go from this small size to this big size. A big size like this, I have no idea if we are talking 14 millimeters or 15 millimeters. This is pretty huge for a Mediterranean coral, okay? This is quite like, whoa, uh, outstanding size of necklace. In Asian necklaces, uh, uh, Asian coral, like this one. Oh, sorry. In Asian coral, that like, like we will see later on, big sizes are common. In Mediterranean coral, big is really, really hard to find. In the Mediterranean, there is another, another kind of coral that is not harvested, is not caught, uh, is not fished by scuba divers. It was uh, collected as a sediment. So it was already dead corals, the branches. They were deposited on a certain area and uh, they, were, they were collected mostly on the 19th century. And the, the huge quantity that, the, uh, that it was harvested made a huge impact in jewelry. This is the very area, this is, uh, oh, by the way, this is Naples, this is uh, Sardi uh, Enzo, he's here near, near the Vesuvius. Hope, hope that the Vesuvius doesn't do. And uh, this is Sicilia, and this is um, Sciacca, the town. And this kind of coral deposits were around this area. And they were collected in high quantity. And still today, you can find not that many raw branches available for cutting, but they used to be manufactured and carved and artistically made into typically Napolitan and jewelry. And this, these, these two in the Liverino collection are quite good examples of Shiaka coral uh, in, in art. I might do a special session on Shaka coral in afterwards, not, not, not today. The other species I want to talk to you about is the Elatius, Pleurocoralium elatius, which uh, it, it's called Momoshera swallow in Italy or Satsuma in Japan. Those coral branches are quite big. So from this kind of coral, which is different than the Mediterranean, is more salmon colored, you can have big chunks. And this is a quite nice watch clock, it's, I think it's called clock, from Vacheron Constantin, it was sold on Sotheby's a couple of years ago, it was retailed by Gublin, and you can see the big carvings of coral, not possible with Mediterranean coral, only possible with that kind of species of uh, Asian coral that we call elatius, the Pleurocoralium elatius. 
when a latius is born albino and hence with no pigments it's what we call angel skin so angel skin coral is nothing more than a trade name for a coral that used to be red or peach and then it it was albino like we have we have albino human you must have seen one before and there is an albino corals and those very rare albino corals they lose the color they don't have pigmentation so instead of being reddish or orangey they tend to be very light pink and when this species pleurocorallium elatius is albino it has a few trade names like angel skin peledangelo in italian bokeh or magai in japanese and it's nothing more than that. We know, although, that the other species that can also be found with albino varieties, but those are really, really very rare. Albino in Elatius is rare. That's why um, uh, this kind of artifact, uh, the angel skin, is used in very high end jewelry. But the albino from uh, Japonicum or from the Mediterranean is even more rare. And it's like a collector's curiosity not a jewelry thing this one is good for jewelry this is a demonstration this is the same species we can see here the sherasuolo or momo which is the reddish one to the angel skin so we can hear the gradation of colors this is the same species but the color can vary that's why when you see a necklace and you see that all the beads are of the same color and if the beads are large and clean and with homogeneous color, you are facing a really rare jewelry artifact. When you, and this is the same with many other gem materials, when you have consistency in high quality, the same color, it's really hard to gather. Sometimes an angel skin necklace can take, take decades to assemble decades it's not one year it's decades to assemble and now with the fishing regulations that are much more strict it's even harder to gather uh, a necklace so um, make note of that and the last one is just a curiosity is the white color i put it here because i just love it white coral uh, which is called shiro in uh, japanese it's quite remarkable and you can see items like this really delicate they look like porcelain or more modern uh, clips, like this one by, by Kawamura. So in the end, wrapping up, uh, from the eight species, I only mentioned those four, because those four are the most abundant ones. I could be here addressing each and every one of them, but we are limited in our, in our time. So we talk about precious corals. We, uh, let, me, let me drink something. I was spitting already. So we've talked about uh, precious corals, and we've defined that precious corals is not the same as corals at large. And we've said that only eight to 10 species are allowed to wear that name in the jewelry trade. Biologists, they, they think differently. But we know that other coral species can, uh, can be also seen in markets as decoration. And there are quite a few of them. And that's why we call all of those that don't go into jewelry items, we call them common corals. And those common corals belong to a variety of groups. And uh, some of them do require some treatment, some cosmetics, if you wish, to become usable and durable. Otherwise, we cannot use them. And those are the groups. Uh, if you are not biologists, you look at this and you do like this, okay? But never mind. What, in, what is important here is to notice that precious corals only had eight to 10 species. The corals at large is more than 7,000 and a few for decoration belong to a variety of groups. So precious corals is quite a special name. It's not the same as common corals, 
and it's not the same as the reef building coral. So make sure we understand this um, correctly. Precious coral is, is a very special thing. And just to illustrate uh, how small is the group that has precious corals, uh, we've designed this chart. And in, here in red, we see the precious corals. All the others are common corals. Those in gray, you can see them in decoration, okay? You can see black corals. You can see, let me see, the bamboo coral, coral that bamboo coral is usually stained, dyed to become red. So there is a lot of species going on. But in jewelry, only this, okay? Cabito, like they say in Napoli, cabicho no cabicho. Right, Enzo? So, because we also know, and Sidjo uh, uh, knows that our, there are sustainability issues to be addressed, it is important to know what species we, you are using and why? Because there is a, a regular, an international a convention that is called CITES, that is the Convention on International Trade in Endangered Species uh, of Fauna and Flora, uh, also known as the Washington Convention, and Portugal signs that convention. Most of your countries also signed that convention. And what CITES does is having three levels of protection of species that are decided in every three years in what is called the Conference of Parties. The last one was uh, last year in Geneva. It, it should be, have been in Sri Lanka, but because of of the uh, enforcing terrorist attack, it was moved to Geneva, and it was the last one, last year. And those three levels of protection are different. And when people say, oh, that species is, is on situs, okay, is on situs, but what does it mean? Because there are different things, and let, let's go over the three, the three basic uh, protection levels, and I'm going to read it through with you uh, so we can keep in track. So in Appendix 1, the more restrictive one, there are species that are threatened, okay, with extinction, and that cannot be traded internationally for primary commercial purposes unless permitted in exceptional, circumstance, uh, uh, exceptional circumstances like scientific or research. So and those species cannot be traded. And in the gem trade, we see quite a few of them, like the hornbill ivory, from a bird, like the sperm oil ivory, like uh, African elephant tortoise shell, okay? All of those are threatened. All of those are banned from the international trade. If you want to trade them, you must go to your country and ask for a CITES certificate to be able to sell and move those historical items, not new products, only historical ones. Then we have the appendix two which is the middle. So there are species that are not necessarily threatened now, but they can become if, if nothing is, is, if measures are not taken. Like our isolation, I mean, we are not threatened, but we must stay at home, otherwise it's going to be, like they say in Italia, a casino. It's going to be very bad for everybody. So that's why we are here. The same with Appendix 2. They are not threatened, but, okay, and we know that in the gem trade we have quite a few examples of, of um, species of biogenic gem materials that are used as uh, in jewelry like ebony which is a very a lovely uh, dark wood jar which is the famous american french uh, artist he uses ebony quite a, quite a lot hypopotamus ivory narwhal queen conch which is the conch pearl not because of the pearl but because of the meat and also the clam pearls and finally, on Appendix 3, species that are not endangered and at a request of one country, CITES was asked to monitor the trade on that species. So Appendix 3 means that every trade, and there is here an example, walrus uh, ivory, that every item, for instance, of uh, walrus ivory, I don't know how to pronounce it properly, uh, if you want to trade it, you need to have a document and issue a document. Why? So governments can have statistics 
so they can have numbers, so they can take measures to better protect the resource. So on Appendix 3, it's really useful to have those data so the governments and the fishing regulations can go according to whatever information is available. And this is quite important to be, to have species on Appendix 3. So let's go to see where corals, precious corals are in situs. So in Appendix 1, there is no, no precious coral species. On Appendix 2, we have the common coral species. And the precious corals are only a few of them in Appendix 3. Why? To monitor. And it's good that they are being monitored so the resource can be maintained and managed in a more intelligent and efficient way. So this is, so there you go. When you hear CITES, in CITES is not like, whoa, CITES. CITES is a normal thing, especially in the Appendix 3. So it's good that the Appendix 3 is on coral so we can have statistics and that measures can be taken to protect the resource so it can last uh, so many years as we can. And this leads us to gem identification because we know that a certain species are on Appendix 3. So it's important to know which one they are. Don't worry. We won't see this chart. This is like the gemological properties of coral, but forget it. Now corals are identified as corals in the lab using fancy equipment. But the most important thing is not to know that it is a coral, but is to know what species. And that if you are knowledgeable in morphology, you can look at the branches, okay? And you can determine what species or groups you are talking about. Of course, now you have more, more complicated things with DNA, but if you are knowledgeable enough, you can know. But when you polish, the morphology goes away. So what do you do? You see a bead, a ball, no morphology, and now. That's why you need a great deal of experience to visually identify the species. Enzo, that you just met, He's got that kind of experience because he was born with color, with color, aye, with coral on his blood. So if you look at the size, the color, the color distribution, the surface characteristics, etc., you can have clues on what species might that be. You can train your eyes, and this was uh, a few months ago when traveling was allowed in Holland, in Schönhoven, Schönhoven, something uh, sounding like that. And that with a few samples that Enzo kindly, generously lent for education, students can learn how to identify, in general, some coral species. And more important than that, acknowledge that more than often, you cannot be sure when you look only visually at the coral. So in gem uh, identification education, there are two things that students must learn. One is to identify. Second, to know exactly the limits of their knowledge so they can say, okay, I don't have enough information to have an opinion, so I must send it to the lab. And today, there is new technology um, related to DNA fingerprinting. I'm not going to elaborate on that, but it's not cheap, but it's not too expensive. And it can identify the species if you have also chemical data to back it up. So this technology, uh, DNA fingerprinting, is slightly destructive. You must do a little scrap uh, and have a little bit of powder of the coral but it's really small. Uh, in, the, in the screen, you see 20 to 50 milligrams, but it can be even lower. And you have a lot of laboratories already issuing reports using DNA, like Danat in Bahrain, I, IGI in Italy, SSCF uh, is also exploring and launching uh, this kind of service, GDTL in Liechtenstein and Geneva also. So you have a lot of, uh, of scientists and scientific laboratories exploring 
DNA fingerprinting for species identification. But this is a laboratory advanced thing. It's not looking at it and saying. And this is important to comply with CITES regulations and, I mean, and, and to help the fishing regulations to be enforced. So uh, knowing the species is quite critical and is really, really quite important. Remember this, this picture. This picture was like the before and after the bleaching of the coral reefs. And this is caused by climate change. And because of that, uh, we know that the United Nations has this development goal chart. And look at here, we have climate action. And we as individuals and as companies, we can do our 50 cents of contribution, not in money, but in business governance, doing some climate action. And Sibjo has launched this program a couple of years ago, which is called the Jewelry Industry Greenhouse Gas Initiative, that invites all participants to at least measure their carbon impact. And if they want, if they choose to do so, they will have some carbon credits in the end of the year, so they can support some uh, positive carbon initiative, planting three trees or whatever. And Enzo Liverino is one of the few I know in this industry that is carbon neutral. So I think it's Enzo Liverino and the beers, the diamond company. And um, I don't know if any, if any of you is carbon neutral, come up and, and say so. And this is quite remarkable. I'm trying to be carbon neutral. I'm, I'm doing the program, but I'm, I have been too lazy. To become carbon neutral is actually an urgency, not only for us as a species, but also for the biodiversity, especially the marine biodiversity where corals are, are, are included. So in conclusion, we are finishing. So precious coral is historical biogenic, biogenic, not organic, gem material, and you remember the arguments. Precious coral is not the same as just coral, and this is quite important, okay? When we say coral, okay, we keep saying a coral ring, coral necklace, but those are precious corals, unless they are actually the common corals, those, those very cheap ones that we, you can see in markets all around the globe. And precious corals are only eight to nine to 10 species, so not the 7,000 species of corals that we've mentioned. And CITES recommends monitoring of a few of those species, and this is quite important. DNA fingerprinting and, and uh, this kind of advanced identification is promising, so the whole trade knows exactly, and the consumer knows exactly what kind of coral are we buying and selling. So they can know if they are sustainable or not, or responsibly sourced as well. And for this, education is a prior priority. <laughs> In the end, I'm, uh, uh, and also carbon action is an urgency. So I invite everyone to, to look at the carbon impact that we all have as individuals and as businesses to, to do the right thing for, for the planet. So thank you very much. And this is a quite nice image from an aquarium with a corallium rubrum. Thank you very much. I'm going to, to open. Enzo's screen um, and also stop the screen and I'm going to share with you a little questionnaire. It's like, it's like a poll, poll, poll. Let me just put some video on, uh, on Enzo. Show you that if, if you want to keep abreast of uh, whatever activities we do here on the web, we, uh, we do on the webinar or on education, I, I have a, a LinkedIn page, which is under my name. Let me see. Some of, you, some of you already follow me. So this is not selling nothing, it's only education, okay? Only educational posts. I also have um, uh, a LinkedIn, a LinkedIn, a LinkedIn, an Instagram page, also only for education. And also, I don't like much Facebook, but I mean, I also have a Facebook under this name. Okay, but you have the links. I gave you the links. So uh, I'm going to open the Q and A. Uh, Enzo, can you see the Q the Q and A? Uh, if you.
click the Q&A button, Enzo. Yes. You can see some questions. Um, I don't know. The, I don't know. Maybe you want to 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 intervene and to, to say something, so I can have a drink, coffee. No, I I, um, I want to just uh, uh, um, say that uh, um, uh, recently uh, uh, the board uh, the the board of director Sebi Joe decide, uh, but this is not official. Uh, in, uh, today I I will have the answer that because of the COVID uh, problem the problem the problem with the coronavirus it uh, looks like it's allowed now to to share the link with the the coral blue book all the all the blue book are free uh, so maybe next time next uh, uh, webinar that you you uh, will do uh, you you can even send the link of the uh, Coral Blue Book together with the, the link with the other uh, things like uh, uh, the do and don'ts or uh, uh, other information on uh, on uh, Coral on Perl and, and so on. Uh, Luisa Pnovas is asking: Is the uh, the artifacts produced in Trapani in the 17th century? included in CITES. I, that I can respond because Trapani uses Mediterranean coral and the Mediterranean coral is not in CITES. So uh, the question is no, uh, not in CITES. And uh, uh, Beverly, she asked, please Enzo share about the Bonaparte jewelry that you have. Share the story because it's a really interesting story, Enzo. I'm going to, I'm going to try to find the, uh, the picture and I share the picture while, while you are speaking. Go ahead, Enzo. Yes. Uh, we had the French uh, uh, king in, uh, in a very short time, uh, was uh, uh, from the end of the uh, uh, 17th century and the beginning of the uh, 18th century. Uh, in which Joaquino Murat and his wife, uh, the, that was the sister, the young sister of uh, Napoleon Bonaparte, he, uh, they, both, both they like very much the coral. So they uh, help the trade of coral, the uh, fishing, the fishermen here, uh, and uh, they even open a, a school and the factory, the first factory was opened by a French guy. Um, and uh, the, the, the relation between uh, the relation between uh, Joaquino Murat and Napoleone Bonaparte was not so good. Uh, let's say because Joaquino Murat was a very handsome uh, guy and Napoleone was a little bit short and fat and uh, so on. So the sister, just to, to, to uh, help his husband to have a good uh, relation with the brother-in-law, uh, she decided and ordered uh, this, uh, um, um, this jewel, the one that you see on the screen. Uh, it takes uh, more than one year to make uh, this uh, jewel. Uh, unfortunately, when uh, unfortunately, but fortunately for me, because when when the jewel was ready and to be donated to the wife of Napoleone, Napoleone divorced uh, from his wife, so the jewel was never uh, uh, get it from uh, uh, Carolina Bonaparte, and remain in uh, in Naples and uh, fortunately uh, my father bought it uh, 78 years ago and is in our museum now that's the story the, st and the story is more funny because uh, a couple of years ago uh, uh, I, I was in touch with the French television that asked to come and make some uh, 
interview and some video of the museum. So when they arrived, they, the first things they ask, Mr. Liverino, where is the uh, Napoleone Bonaparte uh, uh, jewel? I say, I don't know, I don't have. No, you have, you, uh, we, we have made an investigation and you have, I, it's there, it's over there. And they told me all the story uh, on, on, on this uh, jewel. And um, you can even uh, see the uh, video that they made on uh, my Instagram, that is Enzo, Enzo Liverino. Um, uh, there is a short video in which you can uh, see these, uh, these Thank, uh, you. Thank you, Enzo. things. Can, can I have your help in one more question or a couple of questions? And this is quite important. Uh, some people are concerned if the color of the coral is uh, durable. I mean, can it last uh, 10 years, 20 years, 100 years, 300 years? Does it fade? No, the, 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 the color, uh, uh, of, of course, as a biogenic material, organic material, we, we used to say before biogenic material, is um, uh, can in under 200 years can change the color a little bit, not too much, little bit. Uh, there are some care that uh, should be done on the jewelry uh, uh, in uh, coral, but, but this is something that also is in the coral blue book. And I hope that soon we can uh, uh, share with everybody. Uh, what I want that uh, you underline is uh, our uh, carbon-free initiative. Uh, maybe next time you you can uh, do more uh, elaborate on that more yeah. information how, how to do and uh, especially explain that it's something very very easy to do. I know Very, that you are you are really keen in inspiring people to become carbon neutral. Is like the custodian uh, Enzo is like the custodian of of carbon. He's quite keen on uh, envir environmental issues, and uh, he's really carbon neutral. And uh, you humble all of us by by being so. But uh, we we still have we still have two or three more minutes. And uh, Margot, she's a student, and she asks a very interesting question, which is. Are there differences in color and maybe morphology between the Mediterranean coral from Italy, from France, Croatia, Algeria? If there are differences along the Mediterranean, if it is different, the ones right. from Croatia, Italy, Spain, etc. Yes, normally uh, we can say that uh, on the uh, uh, European uh, side of the Mediterranean. Uh, uh, so starting from uh, the uh, Spanish coast, uh, it's uh, quite dark. Uh, when uh, the, 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 the Spanish coral, uh, we can say that is the, the most uh, dark, even these small sites. When we reach the Sardinian and the Corsica uh, island, we found darker color and uh, uh, good sites, uh, uh, sites good enough to make a, a, a beautiful necklace. Uh, so if we move to uh, African North Coast, uh, we found that uh, uh, from uh, Tunisia, Algeria, and Morocco, the color uh, average is a little bit lighter but the size of the coral is uh, quite uh, good, quite big, uh, and uh, the quality is, uh, is good enough. Not like the Sardinian, but is good enough. And then there are other uh, coral, uh, even in the Atlantic Ocean. Uh, there is a, a lot of coral outside uh, Portugal. There is a lot of coral on the uh, Morocco, uh, Atlantic side, even to Cabo Verde. And uh, this uh, let us think that maybe the Atlantic Ocean is, uh, uh, there is a, a lot of coral in the Atlantic, but it's too far 
to, to, to reach the area uh, uh, and uh, too deep uh, for the divers to, to fish the coral there. One, one last question, Enzo, and then we really have to, it's so hard to select so much interesting questions. Edward Johnson asked uh, uh, how big is the market and how many- Hi, Edward, how are you? And, uh, but I see here a quite, quite interesting one, which is, uh, is midway coral and deep sea coral can be considered angel skin, Enzo? No, absolutely not. It can be similar. Uh, can be similar, but uh, uh, absolutely not angel skin because uh, normally 99% uh, uh, they 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 born pink and white. Uh, the um, there are some uh, uh, technique uh, way to uh, uh, distinguish, but sometimes it's quite difficult even for us. Even for us, because if we found a very, very top quality of a midway coral, and uh, we, we have to check with the, not with the microscope, but uh, with the, with the diamond lens, uh, we have to check it better to to understand if it's uh, angel skin or is midway. Okay, um, we are about in the end. Uh, Enzo, thank you so very much for your time this morning. Thank you all of you for have participated and um, talk to you soon. Bye bye. Ciao Enzo. Bye bye. Andrà tutto bene. Ciao. Ci vediamo dopo.